Liam and Talia at Foy Community College's School Report News Broadcast. Our top stories today are university fees affecting views on a higher education and are the budget cuts for the greater good. First up, we have university fees. Are they putting people off? For our BBC School Report, we decided to investigate university fees and how it is for young people who can't afford it in this day and age. To find out, we asked students at our school, our head teacher, and we asked our regional coordinator for the BBC, Luke Tolfi, and multimedia planning editor for the BBC, Ed Goodridge. Expensive. Future. Educational. Fun. An educational experience. I think they'd have to look very carefully at whether they can't afford it because the the loan system for for people now is actually the best it's ever been. Yes, and probably something like French. Yes, and media and criminology. I. Uh, Yes, there is uh, a, a, a lot of support. Um, the government is, is actually quite keen on trying to encourage people who feel they can't afford it to go to university. No. No. I do not. No, I don't. Actually, I didn't go to university. I went to college um, and I studied journalism. Um, I did three, four years, of, 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 uh, but it wasn't here in the UK. It's a slightly different system. I'm from South Africa. And um, I spent three years doing practical and a year of internship. Yes, <laughs> I did. It's not like here where you have a, um, well, you still pay, but you pay afterwards from university. Um, in, in South Africa, you pay up front. Yeah. Oh, I still go to university. Um, yes, absolutely. University, I would absolutely recommend uh, its... It's, it's a brilliant experience. Yes, you learn a lot. Um, yes, having a degree is very useful for an increasing number of jobs. I did go to university, yes, and at university I studied chemistry, which is not really the obvious thing to study if you're going to go into journalism, but that's what I did. It didn't cost me anything, because when I went to university, um, the government system was that, that they assessed how much your parents earned, and depending on what your parents earned, they gave you, the government gave you a grant. Although all hope is not lost, there are many ways to pay back for university, such as bursaries and loans, which do seem expensive in the first instance, but which can be paid back over several years and only when you can afford it. So, all in all, although university seems expensive, the gains outweigh the cost. Moving on, we've got budget cuts and what they really mean. The government says that it will increase capital spending by £3 billion a year from the 2015 to the 2016 tax year. In fact, this increase would actually mean locking in the government's annual rate of investment at somewhat 2014 to 2015 level, which is expected to total at about £50 billion, instead of allowing the investment spending to fall. Chancellor George Osborne said his budget would be for people who work hard and aspire to get on. He predicted that this year the economy would avoid slipping back into a recession. And he said that more people would be in work than ever before and that the number of people claiming unemployment money would fall. Another year, another budget, another string of headlines and numbers. Coming up, we have views on the new and old school uniform. Also, we have arguments over school timings. Should students be going to school later? Firstly, we have school uniform. Is it helping or limiting progress within the students and their future? Over to a live report from Foy. Hello, I'm reporting for BBC School Report. In September 2012, a new uniform was introduced to Foy Community College. The thin cotton red jumpers were changed to smart black blazers, which were embroidered with the school logo. Another change to the dress code was replacing the traditional scrappy ties with the smart clip-on ties, which were adjusted to the colour of your house. Now over to Lauren, who's with the head teacher of Foy Community College, Mr Perry. How do you think the school is looked upon by the public now the new uniform has been introduced? 
Well, all the feedback that we've had from members of the public has been really positive. Um, they're saying say some really interesting things. First of all, they're saying that they're looking smarter than, than they've ever done before, which, um, which we kind of expected because they do look smarter than they've ever done before. But what they're also saying is the students are much more polite in the streets and I even have one, uh, one member of the public say there's much less litter. Um, have you noticed the change in pride of students since the old red jumpers were replaced with the smart black blazers? That's a really interesting question. We, we weren't expecting that, but certainly it felt like a very different school on, on that first day in September. These are the old red jumpers that we used to wear. These are the new smart blazers that we now wear. Hello, I'm here with Amber, who is a local resident in Foy. As a local in Foy, what's your opinion on the recently introduced uniform to Foy Community College? Well, it's certainly been very noticeable, um, and it's a massive change from the red jumpers that, that we had before. Um, and I've noticed that the students seem to carry themselves really well, they look incredibly smart, and they behave very maturely. Do you think the perception of the school has changed? I think in the community over the last few years, the perception of the school has changed massively, and obviously the new uniform has only been going for about a year but I think it's added to a positive perception of the school um, in the public and certainly in the community and um, one only tends to hear positive things about the students now. Thank you. Hello, I'm Luana, reporting for BBC School Report. I'm here with Anna, who's a student at Folk Community College. Do you have more pride in yourself since you've been wearing a blazer? Uh, yeah, definitely. You walk around feeling a lot smarter around the school. That just generally makes you feel better. <laughs> Have you noticed any positive changes in the school? Um, everyone walks around a bit happier and I think we represent our school better as from when we were wearing the scruffy red jumper, so yeah, I think so. Thank you. This is Lauren and Loena reporting for BBC School Report. Back to you, Talia. Thank you. Next up, we have the timings of the school day. Should school start later, Tom and Olivia are investigating. I am Thomas. We are reporting on the current discussion of the school's start times. A school head teacher stated that starting school at 10 a.m., allowing students and teachers to sleep, will improve performance and concentration for the whole school. The school is located near Newcastle, where pupils are especially struggling getting up to the early deadline to get ready for school. It is scientifically proven that teenage boys physically find it harder to wake up in the mornings and some have argued that the later time will benefit them especially. To help justify this argument, let's see what teachers of Foy Community College think, with Catherine reporting. We are with Ms Sherwood asking her opinion. Schools are planning on starting at 10am. What difference do you think this will make? I think it would make a great difference to our students, especially ones who have to get up very early, such as six or half past six in the morning, in order to get their school bus into school on time. Yeah. Do you think it will create an effect on students and teachers as they are used to starting earlier? I think the effect will be more favourable for students who require longer sleep. However, members of staff, such as teachers or teaching assistants, are used to coming into school between seven and eight o'clock and using time to set up the classrooms and so on. It may be that we would still arrive at school that early in order to prepare or take time to mark work. So some changes could be beneficial in ways that we hadn't previously considered. Yeah. A headmaster in a school near Newcastle thinks that school starting at 10 will boost concentration. Do you agree or disagree? I think if a student has had enough rest and has had a good breakfast, they will come to school ready to learn. I think if a student comes to school without enough sleep and without having something to eat or drink, that they won't be as ready to learn and that would affect their overall performance and the progress that they make. So it's not necessarily the time that the school day starts, it's also how we structure and manage our time as individuals. Yeah. What do you think will happen if this change happened here? I think our students would be very happy as they could have longer in bed in the morning and get their buses in later. I think member of staff, members of staff will probably work more in the morning and use that time to prepare their day ahead rather than working later after school and be more flexible in order to still achieve all the things we need to achieve in a productive day. Thank you, Mir. Concluding, concluding the information that we have heard, we can now say that later times could help students' concentration at school. 
It does not differ from the usual time for school that much, and that extra time can make all the difference for everyone. However, some say that earlier times are a routine now, and the earlier times allow the right amount of time after school for homework and spare time. But on the whole, later times could be better. Mr Law, a teacher from Foy Community College, decided to shave his head and raise money for his son's trip to Borneo. Good afternoon. We join you today with our top stories from Foy Community College BBC School Report. Anticipation gathered in the awaiting moment of the school hall as Stuart Law shaved his head in aid for Borneo Charity. Hundreds of students and teachers flooded into the hall to support Mr Law's appeal towards flying to Borneo with his son, Jake. So, you're about to shave your head. How are you feeling now? Uh, I'm getting a bit nervous, to be honest with you. It's getting a bit nerve-wracking and all the press here and all the students watching it. It's a bit scary, really. How much have you raised so far? Uh, well, off the hair, we're hoping between £400 and £500. Uh, but we haven't done a final count yet. People are still donating money and paying to get in to view it. Uh, but uh, we had 224 on the first day, Pounds. Uh, the next day, we to staff and started contributing that much to £324. People have been giving me money since then uh, as well, and donating lots and lots of money. Plus, we've got the collection on the door, so we're hoping to get £450, Mr Law shaved his hair for his son Jake to go to Borneo and build a community centre for the home. It's just like being at home. I just need a 50-inch TV. Liverpool to win this weekend. If you would like to become a journalist, here's a video to show you how. It's Ed and um, he is a news gatherer from the BBC. So, how do you know if something's a good story? Ah, right. Well, we get loads and loads of stories coming into the building. So we get things from the police, from the emergency services, from press releases, things we see in the newspapers, things reporters tell us about. So what makes a good story? Well, I think the first thing to do is think about the audience. Who, who is it who watches Spotlight? Who is it who listens to local radio? And most of the people who watch Spotlight and listen to local radio are people who are probably over 50, the largest number of our listeners and viewers are over 50. So the first thing to do is think about, is this story relevant to our, to our viewers and listeners? Is there anything in this that's going to be interesting to them? And then you need to think about the story. Is it, is it, uh, is it an entertaining story? Can we make it interesting? For television, are there any pictures in it? Um, those are the sorts of things you might want to think about. What got you interested in the BBC? Um, I, I, I've always, I always wanted to work for the BBC because, I mean, yes, I, you know, as, I, as, I, as I've said before, it is, it's, it's a huge news organisation. It's the biggest in the world. It's the most respected in the world. So to work for the BBC is a massive, massive honour and a huge privilege. And I've always wanted to do it. And I've always been interested in, in, in finding out things, in, in, in calling... One of the important things we do is calling people to account, in, in other words. So, you know, if, some, if something is going wrong, we need to report what's going wrong, report on the people who are being affected by it, and say to somebody, you know, why is this going wrong? What are you doing about it? Justify, you know, your use of council taxpayers' money or whatever it is for what, for what you're doing. So I, 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 I love researching things, finding out things, asking questions, solving problems, and working with people. Thank you for your time. That's all right. Very welcome. What do you like best about your job? I like the adrenaline rush. Sometimes it gets a bit too nerve-wracking, and occasionally I feel like I've aged ten years in half an hour. <laughs> but uh, I like the adrenaline rush, the excitement. I also like being able to tell people what's happened today. I, I get a sense of satisfaction from being able to pull together all the main stories of the day in the region and telling viewers what's been going on in the South West, so that's the best bit of the job, really. What would you say is the biggest malfunction you've ever experienced <laughs> when reading the news? That must be uh, when we were due to go live to a, an outside broadcast in West Cornwall and about eight minutes of the programme was due to come from the outside broadcast. And as I was handing over, they told me in my ear that the outside broadcast link, the satellite link, had failed, and that I was to go to a different story. But the story wasn't on auto cue, and we didn't have a script for the story. So I had no way of telling the next <coughs> story. I didn't know what it was about, no idea. 
So I started to fill by talking about the tall ships race, which was the outside broadcast we were supposed to be going to. And I knew we had eight minutes of the programme left, and I thought, I cannot possibly talk for eight minutes. What are we going to do for eight minutes? And we talked for four minutes until someone next door shouted in our ear that there was another story we could go to. Uh, that was nerve-wracking, and I hadn't been here very long then either, so that nearly finished me off that night. <laughs> today. This is Boy Community College reporting for BBC.